FT Senior Insider, Ken Rosenthal. What's going on, Ken? We're breaking down the Boston move. So you want to reply to that? And we just had Tony Maserati on as well. AJ's absolutely right. Boston fans would never go for a full tank job. Frankly, no fans should go for a full tank job. And I know fans get conditioned to trust the process and all this. Well, it doesn't always work. Work for Baltimore because, as AJ said, they tanked like crazy and hit on the picks. It takes both. And there are other organizations that have done similar things and it hasn't worked out the same way. So that's for starters, that no one should tolerate that. And hopefully with the draft lottery and some of the other things that have come about in the recent CBA, there will be less of that now. But Boston is in a funny place because they fired Heim Bloom because it seemed that he wasn't fulfilling management's two-pronged strategy. One was to do this affordably or sustainably, however code word they want to use there. And the other was, at the same time, to build a championship contender. Well, Craig Breslow comes in because while Heim Bloom did the affordable part, the sustainable part, didn't do the championship contender part too well. So here they are. They fire the one guy, bring in the other guy. They're supposedly going to go full throttle, as their chairman Tom Werner promised at the start of the offseason. And to this point, they've not done that. Now, I agree. They need one more big move on the pitching side, Snell or Montgomery. And at that point, fans can safely say, okay, that's decent. I, got, I get what they're doing. But while I like the Grissom trade a lot for them, at the same time, they have not been as aggressive as other large market teams. And make no mistake, they are a large market team. I'm with you, Ken. And also, by the way, um, as you're welcome back, many fans saying you look well rested. So that is <laughs> Tell a, them thank you. <laughs> I, I will. That is a big compliment. And a little bit happened, not a ton, but a little bit happened during that little stretch. So that's the Boston side of things. Just wanted to get your take first off over the past week. What else stood out to you um, that we missed where front offices were supposed to be snoozing a little bit and weren't completely shut down as we saw? The biggest takeaway was the sale trade by far. Mm -hmm. And some of the other moves were interesting. Mitch Garver, Kiermaier, of course. But no one really expected Chris Sale to get traded. He gets traded to a team that needed a starter but was probably thought to be doing bigger things than Chris Sale. And yet the way this deal works for the Braves, it works out really well because they're essentially not paying Chris Sale anything. That money he is owed that is not in the deal. They got $17 million from Boston, but the $10 million he's still owed, or ten and a half, most of it, 10 of the 10 and a half, is deferred until 2039. So Alex Anthopoulos doesn't have to worry about that. He won't most likely be the president of baseball operations in 2039. Also, they give up one player, a good player, Von Grissom, but not multiple players, like you saw go for Tyler Glass now, like, like will go for Dylan Cease and Corbin Burns if they get traded. And you're essentially trading a guy that was going to be an interesting piece for you, Vaughn Grissom. It was kind of a safety net for Jared Kalanick in left field, but not a necessity. So the real question for Atlanta is, was Sale a big enough or good enough addition, considering, of course, how often he's been hurt in recent years? Now, I love Chris Sale. I'm a Chris Sale fan. He came back kind of nicely last year, even though he missed some time. If it works out, great for the Braves. If it doesn't, they're looking at pitching issues, maybe not just this year, but beyond. Is there a situation where the Braves come out looking like they're the winner of this trade, even if Vaughn Grissom turns into the hitter that Alex Anthopoulos said he's going to be, possibly a batting title champion? The way the Braves win the trade, Eric, is simple. If Sale is good this year, pitches them into the playoffs, starts playoff games for them, and then is good enough for them to pick up his $20 million option for next year and effectively becomes a two-year player for them, then they are satisfied with the trade. And it's a good trade for them. And in some ways, they see Sale as kind of what Charlie Morton was when they got him before the 2021 season. Morton had been hurt the year before, the COVID year, and of course has done great things for the Braves. I'm not sure we can count on Chris Sale to be what Charlie Morton has been for the Atlanta Braves, but if he is, then yes, the Braves will have done quite well.
Ken, first time I can ever tell you this, you're wrong, because Scott already said, there's no way they're picking up his $20 million option because, you know, <laughs> it's not Chris Hill of old and this and that. Bullshit, Scott. You're wrong again. Um, by the way, <laughs> we'll, next see. Time, we'll see. Next, next time, Ken, you go on vacation, can we get some decorations for wherever the f hell you are behind you? Because that white wall is distracting. And then my real you're question. distracted is, by a white wall, AJ? That's interesting. Yes. Normally, <laughs> you're in the laundry room defect, or in a closet. Yeah, so, I, so this is a big step for you, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> All right, which of the which of the big free agents left is going to be the next one to sign? Will it be Snell, Bellinger, Montgomery? I mean, I guess maybe Imanaga because doesn't he have a posting time where his time is up after being posted? So, which one of these guys do you think will be the next big name to sign? It's hard to say. And what's interesting now about the free agents remaining, the first four names on that list: Cody Bellinger, Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, and Matt Chapman, all represented by the same guy, Scott Boris. And Scott has been known over the years to move at his own pace. Sometimes that's quick. More often, it's deliberate. And in this case, he now has the top of the market, both the position player market and the starting pitching market, as well as some other players. Reese Hoskins is also a guy he represents, Sean Manaya. So we'll see how this progresses. I don't know that you can predict it. And... It's just going to be really interesting because there are so many teams still. You mentioned the Giants and Red Sox with needs. I would say the Cubs are in that group. I would say the Orioles are in that group. The Blue Jays, we can really go right down the line. The Yankees need another starting pitcher. So with all that demand, I would expect that the remaining players are going to do okay. The good ones, the guys you had on that list. Other than that, we'll have to see. What's going to drop first? The Corbin Burns trade slash... You know, the, not Shane Bieber, he's not in that category. It, or is it a free agency signing and then whoever doesn't get the free agents gets the Corbin Burns, Shane Bieber type of level of players? Don't Dylan Cease. Cease also, of course. Dylan Cease, thank group. you. I knew there was yes. one other person. I had a week and off. And don't worry, I was confusing Dylan Cease with Corbin Burns this morning in a text message <laughs> chain, and that was not good. So <laughs> we're all starting a new year. I don't know what happens first, Eric. Certainly with Cease, the White Sox plan has been to wait for the starting pitchers to go. And then if someone's desperate at that point, which someone most likely will be, that's when they're going to make their best deal. Is it possible they make it before then? Is it possible the Brewers get what they want for Corbin Burns? Of course, these things are always possible. But it would seem to me that the trades would most likely, most likely, I don't know for sure, come after Snell and Montgomery. And um, in your mind, Ken, you know, I know right before uh, we got to the new year, we were talking about some teams that still have to make some some major moves. And uh, we covered Boston, I think, plenty just now. Would the team that pops up the most in your mind still be the Cubs? You think the Giants are going to make major moves at this point? It's kind of the teams we've been talking about looking to strike. I'll throw one more team out there for you, which we'll get to this later with our group. But the Blue Jays bringing in Kiermaier and IKF after the obviously devastating loss for them to not get Shohei Otani. I think there are still high expectations for them to do some damage this offseason. I would agree with that, all of that. And I would even put the Reds in this group. I know they signed Montas over the holidays, but they could still do more. They still have a trade to make if they want to. So this is exactly what we're talking about with regard to the market. A number of teams that would never classify themselves as desperate rather than just looking because they don't want to compromise their leverage. But I would suggest that they're a bit desperate. And the Giants are in that group. The Cubs are in that group. The Blue Jays, to some extent, are in that group. I think the Orioles have to come away with a starter this offseason. They've signed Craig Kimbrell. Not enough. So a number of these teams, and I'm missing some, I'm sure, still have a lot of work to do. And... That's what's going to drive this thing as we go forward. One more. What about the New York Yankees? So they come up short on Yamamoto. I don't know if we really went over the aftermath there, but you at least had the one rumor pop up that, oh, they don't want to pay for Yamamoto as much as Garrett Cole would get. How dare they? They might insult their ace, Ken. I don't know if you saw that one pop up, but your thoughts overall on where the Yankees are at, because I do think they're still trying to make a major splash as well. Well, actually, Scott, I wrote about that the night Yamamoto signed. The idea of going over Cole and 
whether that was a deterrent or not. They'll never admit it was a deterrent. I believe it was. And I don't know that it should have been. And if we ask Gary Cole the question, would you have been bothered by that? His public answer probably would have been, no, not at all. I just want our team to win the World Series. But privately, if you're Gary Cole, what are you thinking? You're thinking this cat has never thrown a pitch in the major leagues and he's getting the most money for a pitcher in major league history more than I got coming off of what I was coming off of in Houston. That might have been a difficult sell. And the Yankees were cognizant of that. I'm sure they were. Now, whether that was why they didn't go to 325, I don't know. But as I wrote right before I went on vacation, their offer was quite good. It had a higher AAV, $30 million a year. It had more money up front in the first five years of the deal, and then the opt-out after five years. With the Dodgers, Yamamoto's opt-out is after six. So you could argue that while the guarantee, the total, wasn't as high, the deal was in some ways better. Early opt-out, earlier opt-out, and the higher AAV. So the Yankees, yes, they did not sign Yamamoto, but they certainly made a sincere effort, even without going over Garrett Cole. Ken, a couple questions about some teams. I know we're talking about Garrett Cole and the Yankees, and they have Garrett Cole, and they, they, made, they made the Juan Soto trade. But Otani left the Angels. What do the Angels do? And, and, and the Cubs are the other team for me. What, what are the Cubs going to do? Because the Cubs are on the – you know, they signed Craig Council on the precipice of allegedly taking the next step. They haven't done anything, okay? And the Angels, they lose Otani, so they, they're supposed to have a bunch of money to spend. They still have Mike Trout. They still have Rendon. They still have some pe younger pieces there. What are what is their plan? Because nobody's no one's even talking about the Angels. And I know that I know the, the ownership Moreno and that is a big deal, but what are the plans for the Angels and the Cubs? Because they haven't done shit. All right, it's gonna take me a while to answer this. The Cubs are obviously looking to either re-sign Bellinger or replace Bellinger. Doesn't have to be through free agency, could be through a trade. They also have to replace Marcus Stroman. I don't expect them to re-sign him, but that is another hole in their team. So both of those areas need to be addressed. Their farm system now is at a point where they can possibly make a trade, even two, and still feel relatively good about where they are. I don't know that they want to get sucked into the Boris trap and having to bid up his clients, Bellinger being one of them. So I would expect them to make at least one trade. The Angels are really interesting, as they always are. Now, yes, you're right, AJ. They do have money to spend. And I expect that they are going to spend some more money. Who knows how much? That's Artie Moreno's choice, and that could change any day, for better or for worse. So the way they see their team, they have the nucleus of a good rotation, mostly homegrown. Those guys were really good two years ago, not as good last year. Those players, Sandoval and some of the others get asked about in trade talks all the time. They also have some pretty interesting position players. The first baseman, Shanuel, the shortstop, uh, Zach Neto, the catcher, Logan Ohapi. These are guys that they feel they can build around. So they're trying to supplement. They've been linked to Teoscar Hernandez. They'll be linked and will be linked to starting pitchers. I do expect them to spend. I do expect them to be relatively aggressive, Obviously, for them to have any kind of success, they need Trout and Rendon to stay on the field, and that hasn't happened. So they're an interesting team, no doubt. I don't know that we can call them a coherent team. We haven't been able to call them that in a while, but I expect them to do some things in the days and weeks ahead. Ken, it is great to see you. We have a lot of off-season left to go here, which is kind of nice for January. It's not going to be a boring January by any means. We're sometimes a little quieter. Um, Fair Territory is coming soon, so we'll get some questions, I think, from fans called out a little bit later today. And I also will end with this. The Fair Territory that you did right before um, we got to New Year's still very much applies as it's a good recap of 2023. So it is great to see you. Happy New Year. We'll catch you uh, in a few days. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, Scott.